Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis, and in this video, this is the second part in our series of videos about EMP Pulse. We have Arthur Bradley back with us again today. If uh, you didn't see the previous video, you should. Here's a link to it. Uh, Arthur is a NASA scientist. He is an electrical engineer, and he knows an awful lot about EMP. He's been my go-to uh, for whenever I'm doing kind of back research for different things. I feel really honored to have him here, and today we're going to be talking about uh, real life events when EMPs have actually happened, when EMPs attack. You know, if we wanted to make this extreme and ultimate and be on the Discovery Channel or something like that. Because a lot of people, they talk about the theory of EMP and there's a lot of math behind it, but there are also real world events where this stuff has happened. So first, I want to thank you, Arthur, for being back with me again today. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me again. Now, uh, you heard my intro, what I want to hear about today is just when does this stuff really happen? And, what do we know for absolute certain about this stuff? What what is what is the stuff that's not just theory? We've seen it happen in the real world. Right. So there's there's different aspects to that question. So on the natural front, like naturally occurring EMPs, um, certainly everyone's probably who studied EMPs familiar with the Carrington event, which happened back in the 1800s, right? And there was basically a large solar emission, a solar coronal mass ejection that that came and struck Earth. And an observer named Carrington saw it coming and watched the effects sort of transpire. Now you can imagine back in the 1850s and 60s, they were using telegraphs to communicate. We didn't have our phone systems, didn't have our computers yet. But even back then, when we were pretty primitive in technology, electrical technology, it caused quite a bit of disruption. It caused some telegraph stations to catch on fire. Essentially what happened is the energy coupled into those telegraph wires and, and overheated systems and caused some fires. And so you can even, you know, you can imagine what it would do today, something very significantly uh, different and certainly more powerful on, on today's technologies. So that's sort of one aspect is these natural occurring EMPs that we've observed. And we've had others since then. They just haven't measured to the same levels as the Carrington event. We actually have coronal mass ejections hit the Earth every single day, um, which makes sense. The sun's close by and it's always spewing its gases our way. And most of the time the Earth can absorb that without much disruption. But every so often, every handful of years, we'll end up getting power outages and other disturbances due to this sort of overwhelming release of energy into our systems. But we haven't yet experienced in our modern age any kind of anything as large as the Carrington event. What about human-caused uh, electromagnetic pulses? I mean, is that anything that's been tested, you know, outside of just a small laboratory environment? How, how do people know that human beings are really capable of creating something like this? Sure. So there's a few good examples. So. Uh, certainly the Starfish Prime example back in the 60s, the U.S. was testing nuclear warheads and we detonated some in the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean and some, I think, eight or nine hundred miles away in Hawaii, they felt the effect of that electromagnetic pulse. Now, I will say that the scientists, they already knew there was going to be an electromagnetic pulse when they did that test. What they didn't expect was the severity of it. It ended up causing some damage in Hawaii, uh, things like uh, garage door openers were damaged, you know, burglar alarms, those kind of things that were sort of receptive to this energy ended up uh, malfunctioning. And so, and that was hundreds of miles away. So it was really the severity that was surprising. Um, but they've known about this as a potential weapon for, call it, at least 50 years. Um, and there have been countries who have overtly made the threat against the United States that they would use it on the United States. Russia, for one, has developed what they call a super EMP weapon, which really just means that they claim they can generate fields that are even higher than than have been measured before. The higher the field, the more damage is expected. Uh, North Korea has made a threat that they would use an EMP against the United States. Um, certainly China uh, has, there's, there's been a lot of hints that this weapon exists and if needed it would be employed. Um, one of the things that they, people like so much about it, let's say like a country like North Korea, is that let's say they could successfully initiate an attack like that. You know, it wouldn't cause any direct destruction or damage that people would see other than their electronics might stop working, their power would go out. But you wouldn't see people lying dead and burned in the streets. And so it would be difficult to make a full, let's say, nuclear retaliation against a country for doing something like that. That's the argument for it anyway. And so it's sort of this, uh, it's a weapon with a great deal of potential for damage, but maybe one that some countries think they could get away with without too much reprisal against them. So it's a unique weapon in that way, and, and certainly it has been tested. Um, the U.S. built something called the Trestle, and I believe that was back in the 70s. It's a huge, it's an interesting structure, still stands today, but it's a huge wooden structure 
that they would take aircraft and other large vehicles and set it atop it and conduct EMP testing on them to see how well they could survive. And everything had to be made out of wood because any metal in it would have distorted the fields. And so it was you know, very, very expensive to build and it was very, very expensive to maintain. We don't use it anymore is my understanding because much of that can be done through simulation now. But it's really interesting and I encourage uh, your viewers to maybe just Google the trestle and see what it looks like. It's pretty neat. You, you touched a little bit on the idea that one of the allures of this weapon is the uh, kind of like the PR angle on it, is that there's not bloody carnage all over the street, but at the same time you can really dis disable your adversary in a lot of important ways. What, what, like, paint a picture for us. If something like this were to happen tomorrow, uh, because that's all of us preppers think it's going to, <laughs> um, uh, if something like this happened tomorrow, what, what would it feel like? What would it look like on a regional basis? And what would it look like within, you know, your own home? Like, what, what would you anticipate that feeling like? What would you anticipate that looking like, uh, sort of in terms of uh, what, what the damage would be? Right. So the first thing is most people wouldn't even know that it happened. It's not like you'd have a visual cue. These are very, very high in the atmosphere. Um, so you wouldn't have a visual cue. You wouldn't hear it happen. Um, what would happen, more than likely what you'd notice is that power would go out. There'd be a sudden blackout. And you wouldn't know the extent of the damage. You might think it's, you know, the local power company shutting off. Um, and then you might find that you had an inability to communicate through radio systems as well because many of the radio systems would likely be damaged. So pretty soon I think people would start to worry that, you know, I'm not able to get any updates. I don't know what's going on. There'd be this sort of void of information I think would be the probably the scariest part initially. And then even your your local utilities would shut down after a time when they lost generator power. So you might lose everything, you know, from water to natural gas to everything else that requires distribution systems. So slowly but surely, your utilities and your infrastructures would unravel. Uh, hospitals within maybe days, maybe a little longer, would start to falter because their backup systems would start to fail. Uh, fuel support, you know, fuel transports, everything would sort of that hinges on the electrical grid would start to come down. Uh, banking systems would be down, people couldn't take credit card payments, you know, everything's electric now, right? Everything's electronic, right? You couldn't go to the store and buy groceries. All that would transpire, I think, in a handful of days. So you'd go from everything kind of being normal to all of a sudden you lose power. Maybe your car would work, maybe your car wouldn't work after the event. Everybody would just kind of be confused, but what you'd find is within a few days you'd realize you don't know what's going on, nobody would tell you because they couldn't, and you wouldn't be able to get any supplies, you wouldn't be able to sort of refresh yourself, and things would only get worse from there. Well, it sounds like exactly what preppers are always preparing for, is just this sudden event that will change life forever, and, uh, and that's why a lot of people in the prepping community like to, you know, be proactive and take steps ahead of time to try to, you know, take a dreadfully awful situation and just make it really, really terrible. Um, so in the next video, what I wanted to talk with you about is what are some things that we can do? I mean, I, I know it's a prepping channel, but we're not just going to do fear mongering. We want to talk about some real concrete things that people can do to make their situation a little bit better uh, or possibly a lot better if something like that happens. So thank you very much for sharing uh, with us today uh, the nature of these things. We'll see you next time and we'll be talking about what you can do to make your situation better if something like this hopefully doesn't, but if it ever happens. That's it. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.